All right. Well, welcome everybody. Like she said, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be with these two incredible authors. Congratulations on your new releases. This is so fun. Um, and I'm glad to be able to virtually meet you um, for the first time. Yes, this is awesome. So we're going to dive right in and start talking about our books, but I was thinking we could do it in kind of a different way. We'll see. Bethany, we'll see. <laughs> but I'm kind of a foodie. So I often like to think about my novels as recipes. So you add in the different pieces to form this entire book, this entire um, finished product, right? So for example, my most recent release is called um, Rise Up From The Embers. And I would say that it's three cups of power hungry gods, one cup of elemental gladiators, three tablespoons feeble pyromaniacs, six pounds of hero with secrets and a potent teaspoon of we're all going to die. So that's how I would describe my, my latest book. Um, what do you think, uh, Charlotte? What, what, how would you describe your, your um, yesterday release? Okay, well, let me think. So to give you all a very quick summary of the Sisters of Reckoning, um, it is a follow-up to the Good Luck Girls in which the main character is kind of in charge of this group of outlaw girls. You know, they have escaped from what is essentially a brothel and they were on the run robbing rich men and fighting off ghosts and soulless bounty hunters and various threats, both natural and supernatural. So the second book picks up and the gang has to come back together to try and take down these robber barons that have been controlling the country and oppressing people for their entire lives. So they are now focusing on helping other people in the way that they kind of helped themselves in the first book. So I guess to say, to put that in a recipe, I would say there is a, um, a pretty solid helping of found family. Um, a dash of horror. I love horror. So the ghosts and the bounty hunters, you know, are a little bit, a little bit spooky. Um, we'll say a, a tablespoon of anti-capitalism and, you know, <laughs> some politics, you know, within and about how these girls are sort of fighting the system. Um, there is a cup of romance. Yeah, it's not the focus, but more so than in the first book, we will see the main character, Aster, kind of starting to become more comfortable with that side of herself. Um, and I guess just like the last bit would be a, a solid helping of swashbuckling fun because it's supposed to be fun more than anything. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I love that. And I'd love to hear that about Aster too. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bethany, would you like to tell us about your books? Yes, and I... <laughs> I have to say I'm not a foodie because I don't, because there's foodies in my family. So I know the difference between being a foodie <laughs> you know and, just, and just being a normal person um, is very, very different. So I wouldn't know how to even write a recipe. Um, a Chorus Rises though is, I mean, the basis of the story is a black girl who refuses to take full responsibility for how the world operates and how the world has set her on a pedestal and why, and whether she's supposed to suddenly change her mind about herself because they have. So um, just like unrepentant hot girl energy. Um, <laughs> and then obviously, as always with my work, it's going to I mean, the cornerstone of it, of course, is going to be social commentary and indicting the American imagination as well as the actual American sociological political structures under which we live. Um, and then there's just a lot of, there's just a lot of negging. There's a lot of, she, it's, a, it's a family book. She's spending time with her cousin and that's my favorite part of, of my uh, interaction with my cousins. So um, lots of family, lots of laughing. She is extremely wry and, and again, defiant, but it's, it's mostly telling America to look at itself. That's, that's what I do. I don't know how to make that food. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I feel like I feel like we have the recipes and then you have the scale right where it like show, throws it back at you <laughs> right <laughs> take a look at what you just ate so <laughs> exactly what have you been eating 
Why were you so unprepared for a new yes. meal? Yeah. Yes. Surprise, <laughs> that number is creeping up on you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So, um, and, and let me also add in as, as, um, a social worker, I was a social worker for uh, 10 years and both of your books really, really sang to my social worker heart. And I think you both do a really beautiful job, um, talking, doing social commentary, talking about the way the world works, uh, be it the old West or be it, you know, more contemporary setting, um, in a way that's also clever and fun and filled with, you know, kind of banter and, and, um, a rollout of adventure. So I, I think, that is, that is my favorite kind of book is to be able to look at a story, to look at the world, but also ride along the story. So I think you both do like an incredible job with that. It's so great. So um, both of your books have strong elements raising from, uh, ranging from problems with social inequality to racism to sexism. But for me, one of the most powerful themes that came through uh, was sisterhood. So I was wondering if you guys could talk, spend a little time um, talking about sisterhood in your books. Sure, um, I can start. It's just in the title of the book. So <laughs> very much um, a focus. I also dedicated this to my sisters. Um, oh. And, you know, the first book was really about Aster, the main character, feeling really protective of her younger sister, Clementine, and wanting to get her out of a bad situation. And now it's really about her trying to create a world where other people are not going to feel like they're put in that position. Um, and it's this idea, again, I said found family, it's this idea that we create our own families, we find the people who love us and who accept us for who we are. Um, and that ultimately is what's most important and what gets us through the hard times. Um, it's really important to me that Sisterhood looked really diverse so you know you've got Aster who's you know she's kind of stoic you know she's strong she's angry that's one version of womanhood you have Clementine who's really feminine really kind of bubbly um there are lots of queer characters Mallow is like me you know she's non-binary very trans mask um a trans girl joins the group um, in this one. And that was also really important to me to show that womanhood, again, it does not have to be cis. That's not what this is about. This is a, you know, a very specific kind of feminism that uplifts all girls and all sisters. Um, so that was just really both fun and really important to write such a wide range of, of um, female characters and to show all the different ways that they can interact and, and the sisterhood. There's, there's ways in which it's Sometimes there's tension between them, you know, competitiveness. Sometimes there's, um, you know, of course there's love, there's banter. Um, so there's just a lot of different angles to it. And um, I think that really is at the core of the story. Mm -hmm. I think for A Chorus Rises, um, it's gonna be very different if you really loved the dynamic and the sisterhood and the found family aspect of sisterhood in A Song Below Water because the entire thrust of that story is the relationship between and the connection between Tavia and Effie. And A Chorus Rises centers Naima, who has actually been a part of sisterhood in, in that she's been a part of the network, that she was a part of the network that protects sirens in Portland. Um, but she's been very much excluded from real sisterhood because of how she has been accepted and idolized um, by the larger community up until the end, obviously, of the first book. So I, I said on a different panel that this book was actually, they were asking if I considered it, if, if I considered my work feminist. And I was saying that uh, A Course Rises specifically is a book that I had to write because of how feminism has left black women specifically behind. Um, it doesn't take our liberation and our autonomy seriously and our concerns seriously. So um, Naima is, it's not a one-on-one -on -one conversation either because to talk about how, how Naima feels, we would have to talk about the sisterhood between Tavia and Effie and how the, it, they only seem to understand their perspective and their situation in the world. Um, and automatically, as a lot of us do sometimes, we'll look at another, another black woman who appears to be in a position 
of privilege and forget how quickly that can change for her and how quickly she can be um, in danger herself so or or simply ejected herself so it's a it's a lot more complicated of a story it's a lot more nuanced of a conversation which was the entire point because I'm like we're done with 101, guys. Um, if that means that we've got to leave you behind, I guess we got to leave you behind because I'm tired of having these one-dimensional stories. This, this story was very much about who gets to be a strong, confident, you know, and we're seeing it right now, like if you look at what's happening with the Olympics and what happened with Simone Biles and, and um, what happens with Black women when they, when, they are, when they take care of themselves, when they put themselves first, when they say they need care, when they say that they need, um, you know, or if they're too strong, if they're too talented, if they're too pretty or something, and, and how the world so easily turns against them. So um, needing sisterhood to expand beyond, okay, we're in the same situation and I completely understand your situation um, and making room for, you know, as Charlotte does in her work, like making room for a lot of different representations and presentations of, of what it is to be a woman and therefore what it is to be a sister. Yep. That's great. That's very well said. Thank you. Um, I almost don't want to go on to the next question. I feel like that was a, that was a, um, a really important point to make. And, um, and I kind of wonder if, um, well, we'll go back to that. We'll go back to that. Moving on a little bit. Um, I love book research. And I know that when you're creating worlds, like both of you have done, you need to include a lot of research. Um, sometimes that can be quick little internet research. Sometimes that can be, um, you know, exploring conversations with people to get more character depth. Uh, and, and so I'm curious, what did both of you do for book research? Um, I really went down the rabbit hole and I love it. Um, I love researching. So for a lot of the Western stuff, you know, I grew up in, um, in Kansas and Dodge City is like a short train right away. So I did go out to Dodge City and, you know, they have the main street still, the historical main street is still there. You can see the old bank, the old saloon, you know, all of it. Um, so that was super helpful. Um, and, you know, of course I read some books that were specifically about, um, kind of the old West as a, as a space, but more helpful was the research I did on sort of like the social, um, and uh, like the oppression, I guess, and societal structures that were occurring, um, in the 19th century. So I always tell people like the two most influential books that I read were um, The Half Has Never Been Told by Edward Baptist, I believe. Um, and that talks a lot about um, enslavement and capitalism and how that really built um, the United States. And the um, Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman, which is about um, the period right after slavery in which black folks were criminalized and sort of put back into um, enslavement through prison systems um, mm -hmm. and these prison debts, which became the basis of the society in the Good Luck Girls in Arqueta. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of research really it radicalized me um, and it radicalized the story for sure. Um, so I think that really more than the sort of, I wouldn't say superficial, but the, the fun stuff, I think that really was more influential than some of the fun stuff about what they were wearing, what they were eating. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did. I did a ton of research, and I, I even included like a little bibliography because I'm a nerd. I include a little bibliography in the back of the first book um, for people who are interested in learning more about like all these issues. That's awesome. Okay, so that really, I have to stay focused on the book we're talking about because um, everything that Charlotte is talking about makes me want to talk about the research I did for so many beginnings, and I realize that that is not what we are here for, but that is extremely relevant to what Charlotte's talking about. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't mind hearing some of yeah, it. I was like, we can get a little off topic. Let's yeah, go. because so many beginnings is historical. Of course, it's my little women remix that comes out next month, actually. And a couple of you seem to have already read it. And I love you. Um, <laughs> but it, it, 
yeah, the research that I did for that was extremely, extremely immersive. Um, I started and primarily uh, because of the limited focus on this period and on specifically freed people colonies, which is where so many beginnings is set in 1863. Um, a lot of my a lot of my foundational research was reading the book by Patricia C. Click, Time Full of Trial, which is specifically about the Roanoke colony, um, the Roanoke Island freed people colony. And basically how it came to be, why it came to be, and how it was, spoiler alert, sabotaged. Um, and, you know, and it, it's just such, as, as Charlotte's talking about, you can't understand American society as it, as it persists right now, as it exists right now, without understanding it, which is why it's such an untaught period. Um, and I've said before, America wants you to believe that Black people came to be in enslavement and then disappeared and then reappeared in the 60s. Um, and that's, and the reason they want you to believe that is because if you understand all of the intentional steps that were taken, you would you would see that this is the past is the present, basically. Um, we could not be here without those intentional steps being taken and sort of like normalizing those systems so that they do run sort of by inertia and on their own and continue to perpetuate the inequities and inequalities and stuff. So. Anyway, I did, I did a lot of, you know, really serious research for that book and, um, and going on JSTOR and reading academic papers that somehow were about the Outer Banks and didn't want to put the information of, apparently about like the, the free Black people that were living there. But if you go into their end notes, there were really serious um addendums and stuff that that where I got a lot of information and of course I did stuff like okay well we're in a very particular part of the country and it's right off the water and of course what does the flora look like what does the fauna look like what were the food restrictions and everything because the book is in 1863 and um, what would they have been wearing and that sort of thing and that was all wonderful but in terms of building characters and building interpersonal relationships and and again, indicting the American imagination and mythology, which is, which is what I'm always doing. Um, that, you know, that information uh, specifically about demythologizing the union, specifically demythologizing abolitionists, um, talking about the American colonial uh, or colonization society and why they wanted to create Liberia. Um, and that, you know, it had nothing to do with the emancipation of black people so much as getting, if, if you're gonna be free, you gotta get out. Mm -hmm because it would destabilize. They didn't want to have freed Black people and enslaved Black people in the same country. So, okay, we're going to keep as many enslaved as possible. And then the ones that are emancipated, we want to send them to Liberia. Um, and again, just the implications of the social and present day implications of all of this. Um, it was just, that was like feeding my soul. And if I could be more radicalized, <laughs> if that is possible, it absolutely happened. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, for A Chorus Rises, funnily enough, I, the only research that I did for A Chorus Rises was, um, I mean, more like a mood board because she goes, she's been in, in Portland, Oregon, which I'm very familiar with. And then she goes down to the Southwest to see her family. And the only thing that I really had to be specific about was okay what the desert actually looks like in this particular region versus just like roadrunner desert um and it had to be close to a um correctional facility a prison because she she does go on a prison visit while she's there she has it's a family reunion and someone in the family is in prison and so they go um and and then also I think a, a body of water very close by because they do like a riverboat thing for the last night. Um, so that's like the extent of the research that I did for A Chorus Rises. Um, a lot of my, a lot of the research that I did when I was doing the Song of the Water, specifically about a loco, um, was for the purpose of reverse engineering a sort of diaspora telephone effect. So I did a lot of research and then I changed a lot of what I learned. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to have that basis in order to do that change. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, of, one of the comments that came through is, uh, y'all are too smart for me. <laughs> and um, I, I think that's in jest, but I, I also want to make a point of saying, um, 
you know, a lot of the stuff you were talking about, uh, Bethany and Charlotte is, is not taught. Um, and, and so this may be the first time you're hearing it and that's totally okay. And, and I mean, we, we, are having these conversations for that very reason, right? And and these wonderful authors are writing these books for this very reason is because they um, they are spreading word about life and about history that you may never have learned um, going to a traditional school. I mean, I I have a, a book Pacifica, which is based on my grandmother's internment um, in World War II. Mm -hmm. and I do school visits on that all the time. And I'd say it's about, 50% of the schools that I visit have no idea what I'm talking about. Absolutely no idea. And a, another percentage of those schools feel very uncomfortable with me bringing it up at all. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, there's a reason these things have been left out of education and, and are continuing to be left out of education. education. So, um, so thank you both for talking about them and for writing about these things in, in varying ways so everybody can learn. You know, yeah, so we, it was what those really important to me because I think you're making a great point. It's really important to me to make sure that these ideas, these very heady, abstract ideas, were accessible and um, I, again fun. I mentioned it at the beginning. Like these are very heavy topics. They're very traumatic topics, um, and I didn't want readers to feel, um, I guess, tortured reading it. So it was important to me that it was still a fun read, so that you are you are learning about these things um, in a way that can be a positive experience for you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I hope that's what readers get out of it. But yeah, I think that's super important for um, authors to try and help readers learn things that they are not gonna be taught elsewhere. Yeah. Well, especially as like, you know, I'm releasing so many beginnings next month and it's literally the work of Trojan horsing actual excavated history into fiction at a time when all over the country it's becoming illegal to teach. Mm -hmm. um, so as a student of sociology, I understand the role of literature. I understand that this is not entertainment. Um, I understand that it's tacitly, overtly and covertly building your imagination. And the longer you go without exposure to it, the more normalized it is and the more resistant to your imagination being challenged you are. So it's extremely important, particularly writing for young people, that we are introducing this and building a solid skepticism in what, because when you read the work and you find out how much of this is true, then you've got to ask, well, wait a minute, why am I not learning it here? What are the implications of that? What am I, you know, as James Baldwin says, like the more educated you become, the more likely you are to look at who's educating you. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. In not so many words, that was a paraphrase, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna grab a couple uh, audience questions before I click back to mine, but these are great. Um, who inspires you the most? Uh, how did you decide, uh, let's start with who inspires you the most? Like writers or right. I'm like, writing. <laughs> I think just you choose in general in life. Who inspires you? <laughs> so many people. Oh. <laughs> I mean, for me, my son is a huge is a huge part of it um, because. I always say like I was born Bethany. I would also say that my son was born Ezra. He is very much been himself the entire time. And um, he has lived in, you know, very inclusive cities and in small, unnaturally white uh, villages. And, um, and he's phenotypically biracial um, and, and identifies as, as a black boy. And so seeing the way that that, that he has, refused to let any setting or scenario change that um, I can't do anything but be, but continue to be bold. If anybody ever questioned like, would you, is there a way for Bethany not to be bold? I mean, you get tired, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you get tired, you get tired of having, you get tired of having to like tell people common sense. Um, you get tired of having people pretend that they don't know things. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, if I, if it were just about me, I think that there are plenty of times that I'd be like, forget you, goodbye. Um, <laughs> but you know, when you're 
13 year old son at the time or like eight year old son is like has the conviction of I don't know just like a a young revival preacher um you're like <laughs> okay I cannot do less than he does right like and I, so he he absolutely is a huge a huge inspiration and to share what I what I do know with him, knowing he's going to put it to use. He is the type of person, if you teach him something, he is going to teach it to someone else. And that's a huge um, inspiration for me. Yeah, I love that. Um, I would say I am really fortunate to have a couple of really close writer friends um, from my debut group. And it really is so necessary to have people um, who understand what it's like to write as a job, uh, it's very different than writing for fun. Um, and seeing them go through the highs and lows and overcome obstacles and continue to be prolific and creative and um, determined is just very, uh, has been very important to me and it really keeps me going. So um, definitely I would say they're probably the most inspirational part of my, of, of my circle right now. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay, so you both have written sequels. Um, how did you decide to make the one story into two? So how did you decide a sequel needed to happen? Um, okay, did so- request it? Sorry, that was the other part of the question. Did someone request it or did it come from you? <laughs> no, um, I would say, you know those memes where it's like, here's that attention you ordered when, you know, when somebody, so for me, this was a spite book and it was like, here's that clap back you ordered because the way that people were, A Song of the Water is about misogynoir. It's specifically about the misogyny directed at black women um, and the way that the entire world is complicit in that. So it was really not okay with me when people were like, I love Tavia, I love Effie, I hate, I hate Naima, I, Naima's the villain, Naima's the antagonist, and I'm like, you think in a book about white supremacy, the antagonist is a 16-year-old Black girl? Um, I have a problem with that. I take umbrage with that, right? So like, uh, I had no intention of writing a follow-up to A Song Below Water, and then it was like, oh, okay, you guys are really insistent on staying in first gear in these conversations and I am not. So um, I wrote what I don't consider a sequel, which might just be me being a weirdo. Um, I just think I, you know, I'm like, fine, let's call it a follow-up, right? But like, it's definitely chronologically taking place after A Song of the Water. And obviously the last events of A Song of the Water are very hugely important in this. But the fact that the story is from a completely different character's perspective um, and has to do with her re reaction and response and treatment based on, yes, a companion is more what I, how I see it. Um, and also the fact that she changes, I wanted to be very clear that this is Naima's story and this is Naima telling the story. And hopefully that would underline the first story you heard. It has nothing to do with me changing my mind about the first story or having any regrets about the first story, but it was told by two specific people. Mm -hmm. And so it's only their perspective. And if you read a book, I wanna challenge this like, um, reading a book and automatically siding with the protagonist and automatically assuming anytime that we just like make somebody a Bible and are like, okay, everything you say is right. Everything you choose to do is right. That to me is like shocking and, and really dangerous. And we need to divest from that just in general, just in life of like making people uh, pedestals and, and, and being like, whatever they, I'm just going to be on their side just forever, because there's a way to love people and not do that. Um, so Naima's story, it was extremely important to me that she not get flattened or, or softened in order to make sense with the first book or in order to continue the tone of the first book. Um, even the copy editor had issues with this because a loco is capitalized in A Chorus Rises and was not in A Song Below Water because the two girls telling the story are not a loco and they miss 
um, wrote it when they pluralized. They said Alokos when they pluralized. And so, yes, it's a follow-up, but it's written by an Aloko. So she's correcting the record. Don't, don't ask her if it's like, well, do you want to decapitalize? Because somebody before you said it was decapitalized. Like, you know, I'm even on that level, I can't not be saying something. I'm sorry. Like, if I tell you to capitalize Black, don't talk to me about a style guide. Capitalize it. Like that's up to me. I tell you how you how you refer to me and how you speak about me. So it's very much a different book from a different person's perspective um, that is obviously related in the world uh, based on the events at the end. But yeah, but I, I think of it as a follow up. I don't think of it as a sequel. I love that, and I, and I love what you said too about correcting the record because that's kind of what you, you're doing with your writing as a whole. And your character right. you're doing within the story itself. So, so much depth. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask Charlotte the same question, but there, uh, in addition to that, there's a specific question, Charlotte, um, mm -hmm. which is what was the experience of writing Good Luck Girls versus the experience of writing this, um, The Sisters of Reckoning? That's a good question. So I guess to answer the sequel part, it was always intended to be a duology. So um, we always knew we wanted a follow-up to the Good Luck Girls. It just was a question of what it was going to be about. Um, I always kind of wanted them to do like, um, sorry. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> That's my friend Miles. Um, <laughs> but I always kind of wanted them to do like a blacklist where they were taking out, you know, these one percenters one by one. Um, so it was really just a matter of figuring out the, um, the logistics of that, the larger emotional journey that needed to happen for the characters, um, you know, how you could have a happy ending. Um, sorry, spoilers, but um, like, I just really uh, enjoyed, again, sort of the fun of them just doing these heists, you know. Um, the cat is Miles, thank you for asking. Miles after Miles Morales. There's um, a lot of for Miles going on right now. <laughs> yes. Um, and then the uh, the second question, what was the second question? Uh, um, oh, the different experience. Um, Sisters was a challenge, I will not lie. Um, and I've heard that everybody struggles with their second book. Um, I think for sure I did in the ways that all people do and that you have these expectations now. Um, you're a little more boxed in when you're writing a sequel creatively by what you did in the first book. Um, the deadlines are just, they were really tight. Um, and also just the fact that I was writing it during the pandemic, I just like really, really, really struggled to be honest. Um, so I'm very relieved to have it out in the world. Um, you know, I, I am proud of the result, but yeah, it was definitely a struggle to get it here. Um, that's a good segue into the next question. What do you do when you get writer's block? Um, I can answer that real quick. So yeah, <laughs> the answer I always give, and somebody else, I wish I remember who said this, but if you are stuck, the process is just to like lower your standards. Like usually when you're stuck, it's not because you have no ideas at all. It's because you don't trust yourself to execute those ideas or you don't think the ideas are good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really not helpful in the beginning stages of writing a book. And I have a very hard time following that advice, but I, I think it's true. It's just like, you try so hard to be perfect and that's usually where writer's block stems from and you just need to let that go and worry about it later. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I'm always like reticent to answer this question because I don't think that I, I don't think that I appreciate or understand what people mean by writer's block because um, A, I don't go to blank pages like I don't just show up to write. Um, I'm going to the page because I have, you know, because it's writing itself. Like I'm, I'm sort of writing it in the background program of my brain. Um, and then also if it's not coming, I just stop. <laughs> like if I write, I'm just like, if I'm not writing, I just stop writing. I, uh, I think that the pressure comes from this. I, I, as somebody who doesn't do nine to fives, and I was a social worker for such a fraction of a second that I would never even like mention it usually if, it, if, if someone else hadn't already. But um, 
I know the traditional, I feel like people have been so successfully trained by sort of the corporate idea of, of work days and productivity and everything that they stress themselves out about a creative process that you decide this, you decide this, like, this is actually yours. This is actually up to you. And if it's, you know, if you're not writing right this second, now, obviously we have deadlines and I understand that, but I just, I don't, I don't try to force myself to do it because I don't know who that would serve. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would get out of that. Um, and I, and I don't want it to become something that isn't my passion that I love to do. So yes, obviously I responsibly set aside times that it's like, you are writing, you are drafting. This is what a deadline is. Um, but if it's not coming in the moment, I watch Bob's Burgers. So <laughs> there you go. I also love that um, there's a author named Lainey Taylor. I, I think it's her. Um, she says that it's just part of writer's block. You need to appreciate it as part of the process. If you get stuck, it's just part of the process. Um, so it, once you see it as this external thing, that's a block that's stopping you in your road, it, it becomes so much harder to get by than if you just say, oh, it's just that's where I am today. Right, and it's just what's happening. That's, now it's time to stop and do something else. Now it's time to switch my mind frame. Now it's time to watch Bob's Burgers, whatever, you know? <laughs> Once you go there, then you can let it go. Um, I love this. What, which of all of your characters would you hang out with and what would you all do? Um, I feel like Mallow, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the other, um, is the character who's kind of like non-binary like I am. Um, kind of a goofball and I feel like we would go do like laser tag or something. <laughs> awesome. Fight a little bit. Um, from my first, uh, from a song below water, um, Gargi, obviously, because he's a gargoyle and um, we would fly around. I mean, it's very <laughs> <laughs> like, it's of course it would be Gargi. In the second book, it would be Courtney, which is uh, Naima's cousin, and I would just go drive around in his ugly car and uh, eat food and just do the stuff that he likes to do. He's very surprisingly low key for a teenage guy, but um, yeah, I would love to hang out with him. I mean, I, to be fair. The heart of him is my cousin Teule. So I'm just really saying I would like to hang out with my cousin Teule. That's nice. I like that. Um, okay, so um, what are your favorite flaw and, and strength combos for characters? Flaw and strength combos. Um, I guess for characters specifically from this series, um, I always say Violet was my favorite to write because she is very flawed, very problematic. Um, and those problems become strengths for her at times, but she still has to kind of unlearn them. So I guess to say exactly what I mean, like, you know, all these girls for the most part are Duskbloods, which is the underclass um, in this world. And then Violet is a Fairblood. So she has a shadow. That's how it's determined whether you have a shadow or not and whether or not you're de um, descended from these um, debt enslaved prison um, families. So she is at the brothel with everybody else. She's at the welcome house with everybody else. She is very much a victim, but she uses what little privilege she has um, and wields it kind of against the other girls to, you know, to kind of cling to what power she can get. Um, and it takes them a long time to learn how to trust her. It takes her a long time to unlearn this traumatic kind of cycle of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but as a result of sort of her, her selfishness and her manipulative and manipulativeness is that she's, really good at lying and like putting on a face. Um, so they use that when they're doing these heists. Like she is the one who as a fair blood and as somebody who is used to kind of working people and tricking people, uh, she can kind of help them get into situations that the other girls can't. Um, so she's very complicated and I, I love writing her. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it's just like, it's, it's definitely pros and cons to her situation. Yeah. I don't think I've ever thought of, of that. Um, I think Naima was so amazing to write because the thing that people think is her flaw is not her flaw, um, is not a flaw. 
she is a black girl who is extremely she loves herself she is very comfortable with herself uh she has a lot of self-esteem it is not fake um and people think that that's her flaw but and i don't think this is a flaw so much as it, it's evidence that even in the position that she was in, she always sort of knew that the world wasn't actually trustworthy because she does not keep a record or give a record of her, of, of what she's done for people. Like she doesn't, she, and she also doesn't expect people to come to her aid. Um, so there are points when like this is not really a spoiler because it happens in the past tense in the book anyway, but she is ejected from the, she's exiled from the network, which is the group within the black community that um, knows who the sirens are and keeps their identities hidden for their, for their safety. And she again was in that in the first book when everybody was talking about what a horrible person she was. Um, and she doesn't, she doesn't defend herself when that happens, even though she's allowed to. And even though no one else came forward to defend her, she does not defend herself. And that to me is her actual, is the actual evidence that she doesn't actually need anybody's approval for, for or, or validation in the things that she has done right and the ways that she has actually helped people. And she doesn't ever try to, she doesn't ever try to change people's minds solely for the benefit of like okay so now you get it because she's kind of like if you don't know me you don't know me like that's mm -hmm. that's just the way it is so I really enjoyed writing her because I think the parts of her that people expected to change are the parts that make them uncomfortable about about black girls and those are not the parts that evolved those are not the parts of her that changed it, it was recognizing that like I have a right to defend myself. I have a right to, to say, you are wrong about me. You have gotten me wrong. And I am to expect people to show up for me too. Mm -hmm. um, as a side note, we're getting a lot of, um, yes, Gargi, Gargi forever. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sorry. laughs> <Side. laughs> um, but you, okay, let's see. You all are so inspiring. What is one thing you would want your younger selves to take away from your writing? If you could give your books to them today. Um, for sure. That point I alluded to earlier that there is no wrong way to be a woman. Um, mm. Mm. And you know, it, it doesn't matter how you look, um, how you act, what you want, you know, who you want. Um, it's just really about finding sisterhood in a way that is meaningful to you. Um, I think that would have been enormously helpful to me. And there are um, things in, you know, my adult life I've discovered that have helped me with that. Like, you know, people talk about Steven Universe a lot because it was one of the um, first really queer um, kids kid shows and, and there's been a lot of progress even just in the few years since it ended. But yeah, that was really like very seminal for me to see that, you know, there's just so many different versions of womanhood. Um, and I wanted to kind of capture that in this series as well and just let readers know that. Um, and Bethany, you spoke so eloquently about Black womanhood specifically. That's that's something that was important to me as well. I wanted to show an angry black girl and validate that um, and asked her, but also to show that black girls can be soft and bubbly in Clementine. Um, and again, that all of that is valid. Um, all of that is allowed. Um, so I hope readers kind of take that away from it, hopefully. Yeah, I think, you know, specifically what Charlotte was just saying, uh, if I could give, if I could give myself anything, my younger self, anything, it would be nuanced representations of Black girls because that is not what I got. I wrote the books I needed, um, which means I did not get them when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, there was very much a, a diversity thing in the 90s, which the reason I have a problem with diversity is because it centers whiteness as the central main course, and then it just garnishes it with other people. And anytime you do that, you take people out of their community, you take people out of their customs, you take people out of their culture, then you don't actually see them properly. You only see them in relation to whiteness. And so what was hugely missing for me 
particularly in literature, um, unless it was like historical. That was my, cho my choice was either to read something that was so long ago that I didn't relate to a ton of it or have a black girl plucked out and set in a white setting with no, with nothing around her to reflect who she is or, or uh, opportunities for her to be herself. It was super important to me to have Tavia and Effie as dual POVs because if you, if you don't allow black girls to see black girls talking to black girls, you're not really seeing black girls. Like the way that we speak amongst ourselves, the way that we speak when we are at rest, the way that we speak when we are safe and calm and all of the, the reason that you get the joy that you get in these books, regardless of what's happening outside is because of community. It's because of the actual representation. I can show you that there is joy I can show you that there is love because we are allowed to be in community and we weren't plucked out and put in somebody else's story. Um, so inclusion over diversity always. And that's what I would, that's what I would give my, that's what I did give my younger self. I, I wrote the books, but I needed. That's awesome. Um, okay. How about, would you want a movie made from your books? Uh, and if so, who would be in it? <laughs> oh, um, I would love a, like an TV, an animated TV adaptation, like Ooh. like adult yeah. animation, like Castlevania kind of Ooh, thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know who would be the voices, but I just would, I think that would be a really cool um, version of this story. Well, you've promised it now, so yeah. that's how I that's how I interpret what what you <laughs> said. Is Charlotte has promised us there is going to be an animated <laughs> series. I can't wait. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That's great. <laughs> <So exciting. laughs> um, yeah, I definitely would like a continuing or limited series television show for the world of A Song Below Water, and. By that time, I don't know if these girls will have aged out, but um, I think of people like Sky Jackson and Marseille Martin, and um, and I would love to also. I like the idea of ingenues because there are so many black girls who do not have the careers that they could have um, because it's like once someone comes in the door, then everything wants to shut down and be like, okay, that's the only one there is. Let's only talk to those girls. And I would love to see, especially because all of my girls are brown skin, dark skin girls, I would love to see new people also being put into those roles. Um, I like when they sort of do, okay, the parent figures or somebody's gonna be an actor that you are familiar with, but the but the actual like main characters, I would love for them to be ingenues, new people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 